I want to remind you that I am uh, doing what's called the common sense method of interpretation. And by common sense, we mean that any written literature, present or past, that the way to understand it is to try to understand what the author of that piece of literature was saying to the first recipients. Now, to do that, you have to know something about the author, something about the recipients, something about why he wrote. I mean, these are just common sense things that all of us do when we write somebody or we read something. And I think it's part of what um, our mind does when we interpret the morning newspaper or a letter from mother or whatever. But we're trying to put it into a structure. Now this that I'm presenting to you is the common sense method of the school of uh, Antioch of Syria. Okay, I'm putting a structure on it, but the presuppositions are the ancient church. Now, starting last time, I got into the method itself, and I know you have some outlines. There are some more outlines on the front. If anybody needs one, they're down here. Please feel free to come and get one while I speak. If you turn to page 30, it's the, probably the second page of that set of the outlines you have, beginning in Roman numeral 4, these are the seven questions, seven questions that try to think through force us to think through who wrote it, when did they write it, why did they write it, read all that they said, did they write anything else on this subject. Now, we add to that the idea that we believe the Holy Spirit is behind all of the production of the Bible, that really there's only one author in Scripture, and that's the Spirit of God. There were different human authors, there were different human situations, but one author one truth, and that's what we're trying to remind ourselves. So Roman numeral five, I start to work through these seven questions. As I remember, last time we were together in, in this seminar, I had just introduced this, this Roman numeral five by saying to you, do you have to read the original language of the author to fully understand what they were saying? Now, just a comment or two about that. Uh, if you were a seminary student and you had the chance to take Koine Greek, Ancient Hebrew, Royal Aramaic, and you had the chance, I think it would be a sin for you not to take the chance to do it because you will be a better interpreter. You'll be able to fine-tune. You'll be able to back up what you believe this says with a knowledge from that. So I think if you have the opportunity... Preacher, teacher, you're responsible under God to take it. But the vast majority of people in the world will never have that opportunity. And I want to remind you that the Bible is for the common man, not for the religious elite. I believe that a translation is adequate to communicate the main truths of Christianity, certainly of how to be saved, and I believe how to live a life that's pleasing to God. So I've made a few comments here at the bottom of page 30. I hope you'll follow with me. This is my presuppositions. I try whenever I can to, to tell you they're my presuppositions because this is the place to, to think through if you agree with me or do not. It's in these presuppositions. Number one, God wants all mankind to know him. That's a basic presupposition of mine. God wants you to know him. Two, he gave us a written record. Yes, to a particular culture. Yes, in a particular time and place. But he gave that written record that we, that we, meaning all Christians of all ages, of all cultures, might know him. Yes, there's a particularity to Scripture, whether it's old or new, but that particularity is swallowed up in the universality of the desire of God to communicate to creatures made in his image and likeness, particularly those who possess the Holy Spirit after salvation. Number three, he sent his son to reconcile us to himself. He wants all human beings to be saved. These are presuppositions of mine. Number, number E, the vast majority of the world only has a translation. Scholars are not priests 
are mediators. They disagree. Which scholar is the perfect uh, transmitter or channel of God's revelation? Scholars don't agree. Number G, scholars are gifts to the church, but the average person can understand for himself, herself, the vast majority of the Bible's message and certainly what is needed for faith and practice. And this is a basic presupposition that the Bible is for the Christian and not for the university. It's for the common person, not some kind of called elite guru group. Now, these are basic presuppositions, but I believe strongly that they are true. So, if that's true, then is there any practical way, if you don't read Greek or Hebrew, is there any practical way to get at the basic message of the author? Yes, I think there is. So, let's talk a minute about how could I better understand an English Bible, okay? Number B on page 31. First of all, I, I suggest to you that uh, translations are adequate to reveal the gospel and God's will for our lives, but you have to handle them with some caution because English translations are not the original and translations vary. So how do we handle the variation and yet the presupposition that God's Spirit can communicate to us through translations? Well, first of all, I would say that there are different translation theories. Now, the first one I've mentioned there, and number two, is what we call a word for word. And that is, if there are 10 Hebrew words, 10 Greek words, the translation in English should have 10 words and 10 words. That it should be a word for word correspondence, okay? Now, the, below it is called the dynamic equivalent. And this, I think, was probably, probably a championed at first by Wycliffe Bible translators and some of the scholars that translate the languages of the world. And it basically says that, you know, it's not always possible in any given language to communicate the truth that 10 Greek words or 10 Hebrew words communicate. In some languages, you kind of got to explain what those words mean. You kind of got to fill out for that culture the implication of these 10 words. And so they say it doesn't matter how many words you use, it matters that you accurately communicate the meaning of those 10 words. Now, that's what the NIV would try to do. I've listed some of the translations on here of these different translation theories. Now, what I would say to you is, one way to help us understand an English translation and the options that are available is to compare a word for word, whether it be King James or New King James or American Standard or New American Standard or Revised Standard or New Revised Standard with a dynamic equivalent like the NIV. And where they disagree, you know you've got to go to the commentaries because that disagreement is either a word option, the Greek or Hebrew word can mean more than one thing, or it's a manuscript problem, or it's a cultural problem, or it's a theological issue. Now, what, what, we, what this is, this targets where we must do more study. And so I think one of the, the best thing we can say to a Sunday school teacher is you need a word for word and a dynamic equivalent. Now, while I'm at this point, I want to make this statement. Of all the study Bibles, and there are a lot of them, only one of them has the footnotes written by the translators. Only one. And that is the NIV Study Bible. It was the first one to ever let the translators write the footnotes, which means that it is not pushing a denominational, theological, personal agenda, but the men and women who translated the text are explaining their understanding of the Greek and Hebrew text. Now, about uh, five years ago, Zondervan took the footnotes out of the NIV Study Bible and adapted them to the NASB. And so for me, because I, I want a word for word as a teacher, the NASB Study Bible, $29.95 hardback, is a great option to run alongside King James, to run alongside NIV. I think the footnotes are helpful. I think the brief introduction to the books are helpful, and I'll show you why in just a minute. But this is a common sense approach, I think, 
to how do we understand what the original author said. Now, in this particular uh, section, you know I'm dealing with manuscript problems. Before we try to fight over, should I handle snakes and drink poison, we need to know there's a manuscript problem there. So, how do I know, if I don't read Greek and Hebrew, how do I know where the manuscript problems are? If they're a major manuscript problem, it's going to be in the footnotes or the side notes. And it's going to say something like this. This text is not in the oldest and best manuscripts. Now, you may not know why. You may not know the hair pull. All I would say to you as a matter of practicality is, as a teacher or a preacher, if your study Bible says this text, this verse, these verses are not in the best Greek or Hebrew manuscripts, do not build a doctrine on that text. Now, that's not heavy. That's just saying to you there are other texts where that doctrine is clearly, unambiguously taught. Wait till you come to that text or go to that text by looking at the parallel passages in the footnotes or the side notes of your study Bible. I don't think that's heavy. I don't think that's disrespectful of the Word of God. So I, I hope you uh, can hear what I say at that point. Number five, on page 31, number five under B, um, I've mentioned to you that um, the book that has really helped me the most, and I didn't read this book first, and then this book changed my mind. I had thought these things, and then somebody confirmed them. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? And that is How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth by Garden Fee and Doug Stewart, particularly page 34 through 44, which I think is the best brief, non-technical discussion of the way people translate the Bible. So I, I hope you will look at that, and I think it'll be a blessing to you. Now, number C is the problems that are caused by manuscript variants. Now, several weeks earlier, I dealt with some of this when I was in the section called the Bible. And uh, this is why I personally am uncomfortable by describing uh, the English Bible with the word inerrant. Uh, most scholars, when they use the word inerrant, refer to the original autographs of the Bible authors. The problem is we don't have any of those. And for the Old Testament, we're over a thousand years away from the autographs. And we're not exactly sure how the autographs work anyway because it looks like there's an editor in parts of the Old Testament. We don't know how they put it together, when they put it together, or who put the Old Testament books together. When it comes to the New Testament, we're still between uh, about 200 years to 400 years away from the autographs. Some of the copies are good and some of the copies are not good. It looks like sometimes if it was a larger church and they had scribes that whenever Paul's letters or some of the other circulating gospels came through, that somebody would copy them for the church to retain the copy as the other copy passed on to other churches. Now, sometimes it's a smaller church or they didn't have a scribe. Somebody tried to copy it, but usually they copied it quickly. They made a lot of mistakes. So just because a manuscript is early, just because it's on papyrus, does not mean it's a good copy. And so people who spend their whole life dealing with this, we call them lower critics, that mean they're short, or textual critics. Now, in, in the back of this seminar, and you don't have the end yet, but you will, in appendix number two, I try to deal with the issue of textual criticism. And I hope you'll look at that. If this bothers you, it does bother some people. I'm sorry for that. When we come to the Old Testament, we're basically looking at the Masoretic text. And, and I certainly think that that is the text of the Pharisees. It, it developed or began to be developed after the fall of Jerusalem when the Sadducees were destroyed and the Essenes were destroyed. And uh, it took until 900 A.D., A.D., 900 A.D., for the Masoretic text to be finished. Um, an, another source is the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls are this, these libraries of these sect groups that rejected the temple during the Roman period and lived out among themselves. Uh, we have now found uh, many, many, many uh, Hebrew copies. I guess the jewel of this is the 29-foot leather scroll of Isaiah found in one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And when we compare that 29-foot leather scroll, which is obviously done in a B.C. period, probably 
hundred year plus B.C. period, when we compare that with the Masoretic text from A.D. 900, we see how accurate the Masoretic text is. So all of your, all of your uh, English Bibles are based primarily on the Masoretic text, not exclusively, but primarily. And then we have the Septuagint. And I personally do not depreciate this as a source because it was done in the 200 B.C. period. This, this translation was done long before the Jews started getting nervous about Jesus of Nazareth being the Messiah. And what we have is the rabbinical understanding of their own scripture 200 years before Christianity calls the conflict. What's going to happen is the Septuagint is going to become the Bible of the early church. Most of the quotes in the New Testament are from the Septuagint. It made the Jews so mad they finally wrote another Greek translation. Just let the church have that one. Uh, it, it does have some problems in it. I know that. We can't solve all those problems. The book of Jeremiah is one-third longer in the Septuagint than it is in the Masoretic text. I can't answer how that happened. There are questions like that, but I want to remind you again, they do not affect a major Christian doctrine. Amen? So it's interesting, but it's not crucial. Now, for the New Testament, we basically have three sources. Those texts written on papyri for the first 200 years. Now, of course, um, papyri does disintegrate so that if you get out of Palestine where it gets wet, these destroy. So we only have a few of them, and most of them are not. matter of fact, the vast majority are not a full book even, much less a full New Testament. Then we had the writings that were done on parchment. Now those are lasting much longer. We have many of those. What's suddenly going to happen is that the, the, these, these manuscripts on these leather become very expensive, and they're done in a form of Greek letters, which they're all capital letters, and there's no space between words. We call them Uncial manuscripts. Now, these are the ones from the 400 year to 600 or maybe even 900 year period that the Bible is being copied on this kind of manuscripts. After this, there is a running style where the letters, kind of like we write instead of print, a minuscule they became known as, the running script. And they are done from the, oh, the 6th century through the 12th century. The vast majority, the vast majority, 3,000 out of the 5,000 copies of the New Testament are from the 12th to 16th century. And they're much, much later. So, uh, I think logic would say it's not the most manuscripts we have, but the earliest manuscripts that we have probably reflects the original author. And that's the assumption that most, most scholars work with. Now, if you'll turn to page 32 at, under number three at the top, I'd like to give you a couple of books here. And uh, what I try to do, I think what someone like me can help is, please don't go to a bookstore and buy the books on sale. Why do you think they're on sale? They're junky books. And there's a million books on every subject. The one thing that a, that a Bible teacher can do is narrow down the books that are credible and helpful. And I hope you'll take uh, at least look at some of these books and the bibliography in them. Now, one of my favorite authors is F.F. F. Bruce, and he has wrote a wonderful book called The Book and the Parchments that tell how we get our New Testament. And I think it's an excellent one. He also wrote one called The New Testament Documents, Are They Reliable?, and I think these two books would help you have great confidence that you have the Word of God in your language and don't need to fear with the manuscript problem here or there. Number four, the other thing I would suggest to you, if it is a good idea to compare translations, you know there is a book called The Bible in 26 Translations that has basically King James in bold print, and then from a pool of 26 other translations, both ancient and modern. It picks up the ancient Syriac called the Peshitta, it picks up the Septuagint, and it picks up many of the early translations of the church, the Vulgate, and then it goes to modern translations. Out of a pool of 26, it'll pick four or five of the most different different translations and puts them all in one place so you don't have to own or try to read 26 different translations. This little book is really a help, the Bible in 26 translations. If you're a Sunday school teacher, it's a very practical way of how to see how many Bibles understand this phrase, understand this word, or deal with this manuscript problem. 
Um, number D, well, by the way, just one more point, number 4C there. If you are, and I know there are many, because Criswell's close and Dallas is close, many of you have uh, academic training. Thank God, what a wonderful place to be. I would say, and I, and I assume still, I know that uh, Dallas still makes an emphasis on languages, although my own school has dropped the requirement for Greek and Hebrew for its uh, Master of Divinity students, which I think is a real tragedy. I still think for those of us who stand in the pulpit, we need to have a little bit more understanding of these Greek manuscripts. Uh, Bruce Metzger was in the room where they began to try to deal with the United Bible Society's Greek text, which is an eclectic text that picks from many of the ancient manuscripts. And the scholars had to say, why do you think this reading is better than this reading? And put an A, B, C, D, uh, very certain, very uncertain rating on that. So this book from the United Bible Society is called A Textual Commentary on the Greek New Testament by Bruce Metzger is in English. You do not have to read Greek. It gives you a list of whether this is very confident as far as this is the reading of the ancient autograph or if this is suspect. So if you're into that, I sure hope you will check this because many, many a fight is on bad manuscripts. And uh, we don't need to fight it. We've got to have to fight up regularly. Let's don't fight about when we don't need to. Number D, Roman numeral, I mean, uh, capital D, the, the problem of human language when talking about God. Now, I, I've discussed this also earlier in the Bible, but I want to reemphasize it. Fallen human beings linked to a particular time and culture are trying to talk about an eternal holy being using human language. Now, you talk about tough. How do we talk about things that are eternal in the language of fallen, culturally affected human vocabulary. Well, it's, it, it's really difficult. So I want to make a, a few comments about that. Number two, uh, it is limited to our fallen human condition and our physical world's terminology. Three, it is never exhaustive. Oh, I hope you hear that. Heaven is far better than you can imagine. Hell is far worse than you can imagine. We're trying to discuss eternal truths in time-locked human terms. They never get the full picture. But look at number four. Please hear me say this. It is adequate to communicate what we can understand at this part of our experience with God. Because God doesn't tell us everything doesn't mean God doesn't tell us what is true. Amen? We're not always sure what is metaphor and what is literal. We are the people of God seeking to walk with him by faith. We want to do his will. We seek his will. We understand it somewhat differently. But when I talk to a Christian and I ask them, can you show me in the Bible where you got that? And they show me a text and give me their rationale. I may not agree with their rationale, but thank God for them, they have paid the price to have a biblical understanding. Amen? So there's some fudge room here. We have to talk about spiritual things in analogous ways. God is a shield. God is a tree. We have to talk about negation. God is not a man that he should lie. We use metaphors and analogy to do this, and sometimes uh, they're somewhat slippery, and, and we all must admit that. All human language is to some extent metaphor. Number E. The problem of interpreting ancient texts, not just is human language a problem, but ancient languages are a problem. Number one, the changing meaning of words and idioms. Uh, you can just take King James and, and English Bible and realize how words have changed meaning. Um, I, I have some examples later on to show you, but obviously 1611 English and 2000, this the 21st century English is going to be different, and it's radically different sometimes. The other thing I would say, and I think we just have to say it, is we're not sure when New Testament authors or Old Testament authors use idioms. Because if you take an idiom and take it literally, you totally miss the message. A good example for me is this whole view of soul sleep. And it's claimed that the Bible teaches that you go to sleep when you die and you wake up when the second coming happens and it's just a brief moment. See, I think they're taking the metaphor of sleep from the Old Testament and David slept with his fathers, putting a Western literalistic understanding on that and then building a doctrine 
and totally missing the Semitic idiom of sleep means death. So if you miss the idiom, you've misinterpreted the text. And none of us fully understands the idioms of either the Old Testament or the New. The, the Old Testament has so many that are so graphic that your translators change them because you would be offended by how graphic the Hebrew Old Testament is. You would. You'd go, oh my goodness, Sunday school. <laughs> the absence of voice inflection and body language. Now, if you're watching somebody speak, you see their face, you see their gestures, you hear their voice. That, that communicates truth, but it's all gone in written communication. And thirdly, the syntactical differences between human languages. Now, I used to think the way to speak Spanish is just put an O on every English word, and that would do it. Well, of course it doesn't, you know, and uh, people looked at me so funny in South America trying to do that. But uh, uh, there's a structural difference, and, and that's true of every language. You cannot put exactly what is said in one language. You cannot fully catch all the inference and connotation when you put it into another but we do have enough understanding to know God, to know His Son, and to know how to live for Him. Amen? No, we don't understand everything, but we understand a lot. Now, Roman numeral 6, the bottom of page 32. This is the second question. The first one had to do with establishing the original text as best we can. This next one has to do with how do I understand that text. Now, I'm trying to make this as, my wife says to me, it's too complicated. What scholars tend to do is try to prepare you for every possible occurrence. <laughs> and of course you can't do it, and it starts making things more and more difficult. It's like the toolbox. You don't use all those tools every time your car's broke. But you need to know something about the tools that are available so when you do have a text that needs it, you know there's a, a theory, a tool, an understanding. And that, that's what I'm providing. So in some ways, this is confusing. I, I hope I can reduce that level. Um, I want to show you all the tools. But I want to say again, if, if you come to this seminar for these many, many weeks, and you just take home one or two things to, to affect your Bible study, come this Sunday in Sunday school. Uh, don't say, well, I can't understand anything, so I take one or two that make sense to you and apply them and see if it's a blessing. If one or two things are a blessing to you, listen to this seminar again and try one or two more. You hear what I'm saying to you? You can be better immediately by applying some of these common sense rules and be protected from Western proof text literalism if you'll try some of them as you study your Bible, both for Sunday school and whatever other Bible studies you do. Now this is under, how do I get a handle on what the author means. The first section, how do I get a handle on what the author really said? Now, I think I know what he said. Now, what does that mean? Now, the best way that, I, that I'm trying to give you a practical, easy-to-do method of this is four reading cycles. And every reading cycle, you just look for a little bit of information. Not a lot, you're going to get overwhelmed. Just one piece of information as you read through the whole book. Now, if we're talking about Colossians or a small Old Testament book, read the whole book. If we're talking about Jeremiah or Deuteronomy, I remember I taught Deuteronomy verse by verse on Wednesday nights at my church in Lubbock. I was so glad when Moses died. I was so sick of Deuteronomy. I mean, holy moly. I know Deuteronomy is too much to read four times, so find the literary unit. Now, how do you do that? Well, that's going to be the key. So, if you want to go, let's just take it practical. If you, haven't, you don't outline well, you haven't done this before, go to the introductory notes in the NIV study Bible or a commentary or a Bible encyclopedia. Find their outline of the book. The major Roman numerals and the major ABCs are usually going to be the literary unit. At least read that many chapters. I was talking to you this morning. You cannot interpret 1 Corinthians 11 if you don't know 11 through 14 are a literary unit. You can't understand the love chapter unless you know it's oreoed between the hair pull over spiritual gifts. You can't let somebody preach out of Matthew 5 and not realize that Matthew 5 through 7 is one sermon. You can't let somebody pull a sermon out of a a Revelation 3.20 and make it a salvation verse when you know that Revelation chapter 2 and 3 are the letters to the seven churches. We must not 
take these texts out of the original author's intent. So just to summarize, because I see the time. I will not be able to get into it tonight, but just a quick summary to close this out. The first reading, you should ask yourself, what is the main truth of this whole book? Because I submit to you, it's just logical that I cannot know what the details mean till I know what the big subject is. If I'm talking about beekeeping in Africa, it would be crazy for someone to say, yes, chapter 2 talks about how you ought to change your oil. No, no, no. You can't change your oil in a beekeeping book. Amen? We can't start reading stuff into this that has nothing to do with the author's intent. How do we know the author's intent? We read the whole letter, the whole book in once. And we say to ourselves, how could I capture in one sentence the subject of this book? What is this book about? Is this a prophecy about the future? Is this about the sun? Is this about the Christian life? What is this book mainly about? Okay? And then you ask yourself, what chapter or verse did I find that in? That's a fair question. If you says it is talking about bird keeping, where did you find that? So someone else can check you. And then the third point, what is the genre? Is this a letter? Is this apocalyptic? Is this a parable? What is the genre? Because genres are different in how we understand them. The second reading, quickly, you go through again and try to find the major literary units. Now, what do I mean by that? Just quickly. Just take Romans for a minute. Romans 1 has a wonderful long introduction, chapter 1, verses 1 through about 15. Paul tells you who he is, why he wrote, and all of that. Then he gives you a summary, chapter 1, 17, uh, 16 and 17. This is the theme of the whole book. The beginning in chapter 118 through 331 is the first main truth. All have sinned. Then he says, this is not new, this is Old Testament. Romans chapter 4. Then exactly what does justification mean? 5 and 6. And then 7 is, is also about justification. It's just a key on struggling with Romans 8. So here we have justification by faith. 5, 6, 7, 8. 9 through 11, what about Israel? Why did they reject the Messiah? 12 through 15, Paul begins to say, how do these truths of justification by faith affect my life every day? And then chapter 16, goodbye. Now, all I've done is outline Romans quickly. And I need to see these big pillars of thought because the only way to follow the original author's intent is to see what he's talking about as a whole and then how does he develop the thought, okay? And that's what the second one is all about. That's all you basically do is do an outline and check the outline. Not all the details, just the big truths. All have sinned. Justification by faith. What is, ju what is justification by faith? Whatever. And then you check yourself from your study Bible, from your commentary, from your Bible encyclopedia. Check your outline. The first few times you do this, you'll have to make some changes in it. Now, you, people say to me all the time, well, I'm not going to do that. Then quit teaching the Bible. We have a lot of opinions of people who haven't paid the price. Just because you prayed and got goosebumps, that wasn't the spirit. You got the flu, fool. This doesn't fall out of heaven and knock people off donkeys. This is a message that must be understood in relationship to its day, its author, its recipients, and its subject. Amen? What we're doing is pulling little pieces and putting Baptist spins or American spins or 21st century spins and claiming to speak for God, and we're saying far more about us than we're saying about the Bible. I'm over it. Uh, reading number three. We're looking now for historical insight. Where do you think those commentators got all that stuff? They read the book. Who wrote it? Who did they write it to? Why did they write it? When did they write it? That's, that's all usually in the first three or four or five or six verses. You just got to get used to it. You can do almost everything a commentary does in introduction if you just get used to reading Reading slowly, reading with questions, looking for certain items of information. So the third reading, you read the whole thing again, and now you're looking for historical insights. Notice them on page 33. The third reading, you're going to start developing your main truths. Um, let's take an example. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 1.18 through 3.31. 
Now I'm going to go to paragraph level. Now, paragraph's not inspired. There's the kicker. But you can check several commentaries. Paragraphs are, if there's English teachers here, a paragraph is a, a group of sentences that have one major truth. Is that right, teachers? Every paragraph has a topical thought or a topical sentence. Every sentence in that paragraph has to deal with that thought. Explain it, limit it, delineate it, something, okay? So paragraphs are those thoughts. Now, this is the most difficult, and, and I'm sorry, I wish I could make it easier, I just can't. Sometimes a paragraph is a, the whole major literary unit, and sometimes the paragraph is way down the outline. You just got to kind of work through this. It's kind of like, remember when you first saw the alphabet and said, I can never memorize that and put that together and make words? and ha You did. First time you saw math, I can't do that. You did. It's just what you get used to. So we're going to try to develop the outline to paragraph level. One sentence, what does this paragraph mean? In relation to what? The literary unit. If you take Romans 1.18 through 3.31, chapter 1 is going to describe the pagan world. Chapter 2 is going to describe moral pagans like Seneca or the Stoics. Then what about the Jews? Why have they rejected it? Then the great good news about justification by faith. First is a series of, 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 of uh, quotes from the Old Testament in chapter 3 about all the times the Jews sinned against their knowledge of Scripture. And then the summary comes at the very end. You can do this. Brothers and sisters, you can do this. And if you do this, you protect yourself from sincere religionists and religious cult leaders, and they are the most dynamic people you're ever going to meet, the most logical in their presentation. You've got to know the Bible, not only so you can live a life pleasing to God, but that you can protect yourself from all the weird religious gobbledygook that's coming into us in a place like ours in America. And how do you do it? Because you know the Bible. Not a proof text here or there. You know what Romans is about. You know what Hosea is about. You see, this will take years. See, that's the problem. We want a fast fix for everything. There's no fast fix for understanding a word of God that's given in history 2,000 or 4,000 years ago. It's just not going to happen overnight. But I promise you, if you'll try this method a time or two, change it. There's nothing holy about this method. Change it after you try it. Put your structure on it. You'll hug my neck in five years if I ever see you again. You try this method. Because all I'm doing is equipping you to be a self-starter when it comes to Bible reading and Bible interpretation. And this book is for you, not for me. This book is for you. God gave it to you. He wants you to know it. A hundred years ago, Baptist laymen knew their Bible as well as any Baptist professor because they read it. That's not true today. Baptists are ignorant of the Bible and are dogmatic in their traditions. Now, if you don't think that, you may ask you a few questions and embarrass you and me. Well, probably ought to quit on that one. Uh, I'll come back, and I'm going to do this in much more detail next time, but I, I want to show you that I'm trying to put this on a level where lay people, and I hate that name, but the common person in the pew can read the Bible with understanding and clarity. Because, friends, you've got the gift of the Holy Spirit. You've got the gift of God-given authoritative Scripture. And you are a child of God who He wants to communicate with. It should not be this hard. There should not be this much confusion. And we've got to try to get back to, tell me what you believe, where you get it. And that's a fair question. I still am haunted by D.A. Carson from Trinity Evangelical statement about to claim that the Bible is inerrant and then can't agree on almost anything it says is self-defeating. We do not want to hold this up and say, oh, Lord, wonderful. We want to live Christ-like lives. The goal of Bible knowledge is not Bible trivia. The goal of Bible knowledge is is Christ-like daily living. Amen? Lord, I thank you for these who come every week. I know this is an area they haven't thought about, that it's somewhat confusing and trying so quickly to deal with this. Thank you for their desire to know you better, to be able to handle their Bible more adequately and in a way that they can understand and apply it. 
I thank you for the desires. I pray, Lord, you would protect us from the quick fix mentality. Or Baptists always believe. Or my mother said. Or the Spirit told me last night. God, deliver us from these, uh, these family traditions and quick fixes and proof texts that have caused so much havoc among your people. Lord, we love you. All of us love you. Now, we're going to disagree, Lord. But, Lord, help us to love one another and live a life that's pleasing to you and reach those people that our personality and our understanding of the gospel can reach and help us to join hands and face a lost world. But do it in Bible knowledge and not just in arrogance and tradition. I just thank you, Lord, for these, these Christians. I pray you would protect them from the evil one. I pray you would continue to accentuate the hunger for you and your word in their life. And I just, um, I just marvel at a love that reaches through the centuries and through the cultures and loves us in spite of ourselves and stays with us and works with us throughout life, even amidst our rebellion and sin. Do open our eyes. Do help us understand. And then help us to be the people of God that the world will know that we've been with you. Holy Spirit, thank you for these moments. In Jesus' name, amen.